A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the third technical session of basic and applied science track. This session under physical science, which will be chaired by senior professor M. Dayapal P. Da Costa. Senior professor Mr. Dayapal Da Costa is a senior professor at Department of Chemistry, Faculty of Science, University of Colombo. He obtained his PhD from Dale House University, Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada in organic chemistry and in photochemistry. His main research interests are photo-induced electron transfer studies of biochromophobic compounds, designing, synthesis studies and application of fluorescence probes in analysis of trace metal ions, and fabrications and development of modified carbon past paste electrodes for analysis of trace metal ions by stripping water metry. Senior Professor M. Dayapal Da Costa is a fellow of Institute of Chemistry, Sri Lanka and Chartered Chemist, as well as a member of Sri Lanka Association for the Advancement for the Science. Throughout his prestigious career, he has held many posts such as President, Slash Section E2, President, Institute of Chemistry, Siron Chairman, Sectorial Committee, Sri Lanka Standard Institution, 2015 to 2021, to name a few. He has also awarded with Presidential Award for Research a number of years, awarding Research Excellent, University of Colombo, and Postdoctoral Fellowship to list a few. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Senior Professor M. Dayapal Da Costa. Over to you, sir. So on behalf of the KDU, I welcome all of you to this uh, physical science uh, session, physical science basic and physical science session. And there will be um, six presentation for today. And uh, first of all, I will uh, briefly tell you the um, procedure of uh, presentation. Um, <coughs> uh, when you start the presentation after 10 minutes, there will be uh, one bell uh, to indicate that uh, you have reached to the 10 minutes time scale. And after 12 minutes, uh, uh, two, uh, the bell will be uh, uh, tapped <coughs> twice. And then uh, 15 minutes, you have to stop the answering, the uh, presentation. And uh, then there will be uh, five minutes for the uh, question and answering. Okay, so you are clear with the uh, procedure. And in this session, uh, there will be um, six presentation, uh, mostly on uh, uh, chemistry, uh, as well as statistics. I can see one paper on statistics and the biochemistry also. So the, shall we move on to the pres presentation? Is it, is it one? Okay, so it's. <coughs> so the first presentation is on a solvent polymeric membrane ion selective electrode based on NN, uh, this salicylaldehyde 4 chloro O penile diamine ligands. The authors are MIS Kumar Singh, A. E. Tilakaratna, and Hashini Pereira. Uh, this will be presented by the uh, MIS Kumar Singh. And I um, invite MIS Kumar Singh to start your presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ishani Kumar Singer from the Department of Chemistry, Faculty of Science, University of Colombo. Uh, first of all, let me thank you all for being here today and welcome to my presentation. As you can see on the screen, today I'm here to present you about my final year research project 
on the topic of a solvent polymeric membrane ion selective electrode based on NN dash with salicylaldehyde for fluoro orthophenidine diamine ligand, which is related to the PEP ID 616. So let's get started. As we all know, heavy metal pollution have become one of the main challenging problem that we are facing today as the whole world. That is because heavy metals are uh, heavy metals are toxic and dangerous pollutants that are second only to pesticides in environmental importance. And they are not biodegradable. Therefore, they accumulate and persist for many years in ecological systems. Uh, so when those heavy metals are exposed to the environment by agricultural, industrial, or domestic activities, the plants, animals in those contaminated areas will absorb those heavy metals. So then, uh, by eventually, by food chains or by direct consumption of those plants, animals, and water, these heavy metals come into our bodies. But still, we don't know about a particular natural mechanism that can remove those heavy metals from our bodies. So I think it is very important to detect heavy metal concentration in food and environmental samples for both the human well-being and uh, to keep the environmental quality. Uh, as uh, people who study science, we know there are various standard analytical techniques to detect these heavy metal concentrations in food and environmental samples, such as spectroscopic methods. But the problem related with these uh, standard analytical methods uh, is uh, they are bound with very complex instruments, and uh, uh, they require specially trained people to operate those instruments. So I think it is very important to prepare, uh, it is very important to develop uh, very easy and simple methods to detect heavy metals in food and environmental samples. So in this project, my objective was to fabricate an electrochemical sensor to detect metal ions using NN dash bisalsaldehyde for chloro orthophenylene diamine ligand, which is a cellophane type shift based ligand. In this process, a few steps were involved. They are to synthesize and characterize uh, the cellophane type shift based ligand and to construct the solvent polymeric membrane electrode and to characterize the prepared electrode. Uh, in this slide, you can see the uh, reaction scheme for the synthesis of the cellophane type shift based ligand that involves two molecules of salicylaldehyde and one molecule of folklore of phenylene diamide ligand, and uh, ultimately, we can get the required ligand. To brief, out the, uh, to brief out the synthesis process, uh, at first, for chloro orthopenylene diamine was dissolved in double distilled ethanol, and then it was slowly added to a solution containing salicylaldehyde in double distilled ethanol, and then the reaction mixture was stirred for two hours at 40 to 50 degrees of Celsius, and next the precipitate form was cooled to room temperature, collected and washed with water followed by ethanol. Uh, then the crude product was recrystallized in ethanol and finally dried at 50 degrees of Celsius overnight to get the final product. To characterize the prepared ligand, I was able to use two spectroscopic methods. They are uh, Fourier transform IR spectroscopy and UV visible spectroscopy. Uh, here at first you can see the IR spectrum of the pure ligand and uh, next to that uh, you can see the UV visible spectrum for the pure ligand. In IR spectrum, uh, there you can see uh, three main peaks. The peak at 1612 is for the uh, it's for the stretching of CN double bond. In molecule, we can see there are two CN double bonds. The uh, two CN double bonds confirms the formation of the required lichen uh, by the reaction between two salicylaldehyde molecules and one uh, for chloro or orthophenyl. Uh, diamine ligand molecule. So uh, there you can see another characteristic two peaks. Uh, one at 1,275 per centimeters is for the stretching of uh, CO1, and uh, the peak at 749 per centimeters is for the stretching of CCL1. Uh, next, you can see the UV visible spectrum. There are uh, 
uh, one peak is at uh, two, 230 nanometers for the five to five star transition of the aromatic system. And uh, another peak is at uh, 360 nanometers for the end five star transition of the conjugated CN two double bonds. Uh, in this slide, I have listed out the components of the ion selective membrane, which I was prepared. Uh, th as the INFO, the synthesized ligand was used, which is a cellophane type shift based ligand. And as the ion exchange, uh, potassium tetrakis, fluoro, phenyl borate was used, and two nitrophenyl octide ether was used as the plasticizer, and polyvinyl chloride, which is also known as PVC, was used as the polymer matrix. Then, uh, then the prepared silver, silver chloride reference electrode and ion selective membrane were, uh, assemble, were used to assemble the ion selective electrode and to the, um, characterize the prepared ion selective electrode, potentiometric response of the aqueous solutions of set of ions were investigated. Those ions are listed here. They are cobalt two plus, nickel two plus, copper two plus, potassium plus, lead two plus, and chromium three plus. Uh, let me first talk about the potential drift of the sensor. As you can see here, this plot explains uh, the variation of open circuit potential with the time. Uh, here you can see there is a significant drop of potential within the first two minutes. That's because of the equilibration process. And after that two minutes time, it seems that the electrode response starts to become stable. Therefore, the potential measurements were taken after two minutes time of dip in the electrode in the solution. Here in this slide, uh, I have summarized the potentiometric responses of the sensor uh, towards the uh, metal lines which I have mentioned previously. Uh, as you can see in this plot, the observed order for the response for cations is as follows. The lowest response was observed for potassium plus science and the highest response was observed for chromium three plus science. But uh, as you can see here, the response for the chromium three plus science is not stable. And um, the equation which is given in the purple color explains that uh, the, there we can't see the Nernstein's law for the chromium three plus science. But the response for lead two plus science is the second highest and it is very stable. Therefore, let two plus ions is chosen as the selective ion for membrane to study the selectivity of the membrane. Here, to study the selectivity of the lead sensor, the method used was separate solution method. Uh, in this method, potential of the um, primary, uh, primary ion, which is denoted by I, and the interfering ions, which, is, which are denoted by J, were measured separately. And then the potential versus activity of the ions were plotted separately to obtain the EJ0 and e EI0 to calculate the selectivity coefficient using the Nikolsky Eisenman equation, which I have mentioned here. In this table, you can see um, I have listed out the selectivity coefficient for each and every metal ion, cobalt 2 plus ions and nickel 2 plus ions. To study the limit of detection, the response of the lead sensor towards lead 2 plus science were investigated within the concentration range of 10 to the power minus 8 to 10 to the power minus 1 mass per cubic decimeters in aqueous solutions of lead 2 plus. Uh, here the, this uh, calibration plot explains that there is a linear relationship with the Nernstein slope of 33.2 milliwatts per decade even for that concentration range. There are four uh, I think further investigations are required for an accurate determination of uh, limit of detection and the linear response range of the prepared electrode. So in conclusion, I can say that in the study, a solvent polymeric membrane ion selective electrode was prepared using nn bisalsaldehyde for chloro or the phenylindiamine ligand, which is a cellophane type shift based ligand. According to the results, the selectivity pattern of the uh, sensor is as follows. You can see uh, the chromium, the sensor is very selective towards chromium three plus ions rather than lead two plus ions. But the prepared membrane sensor has, has responded towards lead two plus ions 
with a significant uh, nurse chain slope of 33.2 millivolts per decade for the concentration range of 10 to the power minus 8 to 10 to the power minus 1 mass per cubic decimeters. As people who study science, we know that chromium 3 plus ions contain in environmental and food sample is very low than comparing with the lead 2 plus ions. Therefore, I think the prepared electrode can be used for the determination of lead 2 plus ions in aqueous solutions mm, successfully. In this slide, I have uh, listed out the references that I have used to prepare uh, this presentation. And I have come to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, we'll start the question session. Any questions? So thank you for the presentation. Uh, so what is the percent error of your? Sorry? What is the percent error? Percent error? Yes. So I didn't get that. Or else, uh, maybe, uh, so if you, if you compare with your results with a commercially available uh, instrument, something like that, so how much variation are you getting for that? couldn't do the that much studies for the commercial samples. Okay, uh, and also, uh, so your graph, uh, uh, R value for your uh, calibration graph is around like po uh, the 0.93. So it's, it's kind of like a little low, no? Because you're expecting like uh, R value is 0.99 uh, for I, uh, calibration graphs. So, so can you comment on that? Uh, yeah, R squared value is a uh, little much uh, deviate from one, and so uh, it is because I think uh, the range is a little bit, uh, the range is a little bit lower. So I think uh, the when uh, we, if, if I check the uh, response of the sensor towards uh, more, uh, Solutions contain, uh, containing concentrations more less than 10 to the power minus 8, uh, it will be closer to one. Uh, maybe I think you have to check with uh, different uh, detection limits to check. Yeah, I like think uh, if you take the first four and the last four, the slopes are a little different. Yes. That's so, so the range is too big. So if you select uh, two different ranges with two calibration, mm -hmm. you may have a better correlation. Yeah, that's what I'm expecting. So yes. I'm expecting. And I think uh, you must be able to uh, clear that. Uh, have you done any uh, real sample? Not yet, sir. No. Okay. So then uh, percentage error would not be possible to are you planning to do the yes sir yeah i think it will be essential for these type of cases No, the, the, there is a uh, correlation between the potential and the concentration, which given by the log of the concentration and the potential. So it, that's the equation. <laughs> Sorry. <Yeah. laughs> no, that's, that's okay because uh, the relationship is establishment. So you have to work for that. Any more questions? Uh, okay, uh, it looks 
looks like very preliminary work, but um, there are a lot of uh, avenues to uh, explore more. And um, thank you very much for presenting. And shall we thank the presenter in the general manner? Okay, the next presentation is on uh, silver nanoparticles as uh, cells active uh, probes for detecting uh, melamine. And uh, the authors are CSP uh, Vidhanalagi, UD Rodrigo, Hello, and A. Tilakaragna. It is presented by CSP Vidhanalagi. Hello everyone, I'm Chashita Shanaka from Department of Chemistry, University of Colombo. I will present the use of uh, silver nanoparticles as uh, surface enhanced Raman spectroscopic active probes for detecting melamine, which was my final year undergraduate research. First, we'll have a look at of the background of the research. So melamine is a common food adulterant, especially in milk products. In 2007, pet food contaminated with melamine in USA was reported. Melamine contamination in Chinese milk products reported in 2008, and that caused few babies to get death and caused large number of infants to be seriously ill having acute kidney failure. Therefore, Chinese milk products were banned from many countries. So having an effective detection method for melamine is very important. Uh, so the objective of my research is to develop a surface enhanced Raman spectroscopic probe for, de uh, for the qualitative and quantitative detection of melamine. So what is melamine? This is the chemical structure of melamine, and it has 67% uh, of nitrogen by its molecular weight. So the methods that are available for protein detection in food involves the quantification of organic nitrogen, but not protein-bound nitrogen. Therefore, once non-proteinaceous nitrogen-containing compounds like melamine are added to milk products, the apparent protein content will get increased. So the high levels of melamine in milk is harmful to humans and to pets. So in this research, I used Raman spectroscopy as a tool to detect melamine. Uh, this is a schematic representation of the backscattering geometry of the Raman spectrophotometer. Uh, so the laser beam is guided towards a sample via the objective lenses. And uh, once the laser beam interacts with the sample, it scatters in all directions. And the uh, scattering along the pathway of the incident beam is known as the backscattering. And it contains both the Rayleigh photons and the Raman photons. So using a dichroic mirror, the Rayleigh photons are being uh, reflected via 90 degrees and uh, transmits the Raman photons, the emission filter, further filters the Raman photons and guided them towards the slit uh, and via the slit towards the CCD detector. Uh, so uh, this is the research grade Raman spectrophotometer available at University of Colombo. So the figure A shows the backscattered geometry of the Raman spectrophotometer and figure B is the uh, same setup with 532 nanometer uh, laser green glow in the figure. And the figure 3 uh, corresponds to uh, the laser beam mounted and guided to the system with spectrograph seen in the background. So using the research grade Raman spectrophotometer, a Raman spectrum of solid melamine was obtained. And this Raman spectrum of solid melamine shows uh, four characteristic Raman bands. 
the band at uh, 402 per centimeter corresponds to C and bend in vibration and the band at 598 per centimeter corresponds to NH2 twist in vibration and the band at 691 per centimeter corresponds to ring breathe in vibration involving the in-plane deformation of the triacine ring and that is the most intense band in this spectrum. Uh, then the band at 998 per centimeter corresponds to CNC or NCN bent in vibration of the triacine ring. Uh, so this slide contains uh, the Raman spectra of concentration series of melamine in solution. Uh, so uh, for very high concentrations like 2000 ppm also, only a, a slightly intense uh, characteristic band for melamine can be seen. Uh, so this is an inherent problem in Raman spectroscopy. Uh, Raman spectroscopy has a low sensitivity in the solution phase. It is mainly because only one photon out of the uh, out of 10, six photons will get inelastically scattered. Uh, therefore, uh, having uh, therefore a surface-enhanced Raman spectroscopic method was investigated. So in the surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy, uh, the plasmonic properties of metal nanoparticles allows the amplification of the Raman signal. So in this research, uh, silver nanoparticles were used to carry out the research. Uh, this slide shows the SERS detection mechanism. Uh, so the synthesized silver nanoparticles uh, are citrate stabilized silver nanoparticles and the citrate stabilized silver nanoparticles are negatively charged and once melamine is added to the citrate stabilized silver nanoparticles, melamine binds to the silver nanoparticles via coordination interactions uh, and that will cause the nanoparticles to get aggregate. So it will produce a large number of hotspots. So the hotspots are areas with higher field enhancement and therefore it provides higher amount of scattering. Uh, so a high intensity of the characteristic peak for melamine can be observed. So in developing a surface enhanced Raman spectroscopic probe, the first step is to uh, synthesize silver nanoparticles. Uh, so in uh, synthesis of the silver nanoparticles, a, sm uh, a small mass of silver nitrate was dissolved in deionized water and heated to boil and then 1% uh, of sodium citrate was added to the boiling solution and uh, it, was, uh, keep, it was kept for boiling until a yellow-brown solution was obtained. Then uh, the mixture was cooled down to room temperature and uh, the mixture was characterized using UV visible spectroscopy and transmission electron microscopy. Uh, so for further uh, experiments, uh, the silver nanoparticle solution can be stored uh, in the re refrigerator. So uh, developing uh, the search probe involves the combination of nanoparticles with the sample matting method. So in the hanging drop method, laser was illuminated onto the hanging drop of the solution. And here uh, the nanoparticles and the sample both are in the solution phase. And uh, in the drop casting method, uh, the laser was illuminated onto the drop casted area of the glass slide and here both the nanoparticles and samples are in the substrate phase. Uh, so this slide shows uh, the SIR spectra obtained for concentration series of melamine using the hanging drop method to mount the sample. Uh, so um, this spectra shows that for 2000 ppm and 1000 ppm, a highly intense characteristic band for melamine is seen compared to the Raman spectra. 
but uh, still with 2.5 ppm and 100 ppm, no surge peak is been observed. Uh, therefore, uh, moved into the uh, drop casting method. Uh, drop casting method. Uh, so this slide uh, shows uh, shows the surge spectra for concentration series of melamine using drop casting method. So with the drop casting method, uh, it is clear that for 0 0.2 ppm, 2.5 ppm also, the characteristic peak for melamine uh, can be observed. Um, considering the overall result, uh, it is clear that drop casting method uh, gives better results in SERS than the hanging drop method. Uh, that is mainly uh, due to the concentration of nanoparticles onto a, a surface and the restriction of nanoparticles from undergoing Brownian motions in the drop casting method. So the method validation was performed using uh, silver nanoparticles drop casted onto a glass slide and the limit of detection uh, obtained was 3.05 ppm limit of quantification was 10.16 ppm and the recovery percentage was 92.37 percent. Uh, so this slide shows a comparison uh, of methods that are available in literature with our work. Uh, so to conclude, the sensitive source proper detecting lower concentrations of melamine was produced by drop casting silver nanoparticles. So this preliminary study can address shortcomings of high cost and sophisticated detection techniques and enables the applicability in on-site detection of melamine. Uh, so further investigations are ongoing to optimize the conditions and to get a uniformly distributed substrate. Uh, so these are the references I used uh, in preparing this presentation. Uh, the finally, the acknowledgement, uh, the authors are thankful for Dr. Neranga Abesingha and Dr. Siyad Gunavardhana for providing access to the Raman Spectroscopic Facility and the assistance with it at the Center for Instrument Development un at University of Colombo. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, now it's uh, question time. I think the method is not completely validated yet. So I don't think that you can use this method uh, without the validation. The HPLC method possible, but I don't think uh, we have the right columns to use uh, for the yeah. HPLC uh, detection. Even in uh, CISIR also? Uh, CISIR they have. They have, no? They have. show the uh, peaks for the different concentration by drop casting the uh, This one, sir. One. So you have only one peak uh, for the highest concentration, the highest two concentration. The other four are having not a sharp peak like Sorry, sir, I didn't the first two yes. are sharp peaks, yes. single peak. The next three are not single peaks. No? Separate the
verse 3, there is splitting, some kind of a splitting there that uh, we don't know why it is so. Uh, there may be some uh, another species which we. Yeah, another Sir, the same question what I am asking. Now, this, uh, this graph shows that what is your detection level, the problem with the detection level, isn't it, sir? I mean, having now few peaks in the lower concentrations, mm -hmm. so what is the, in your one, what is the minimum and the highest detection level? Uh, concentrations, I mean. The minimum concentration that can be detected with the higher level of confidence, I, I mean the limit of detection is 3.05 ppm. You and I know particles are negatively charged or positively charged? Negatively charged, like mm. gas or this particular particle is negatively charged, right? Negatively charged. Yeah, negatively charged. So how can you have uh, coordination bonds with uh, nitrogen? Uh, uh, melamine and nitrogen uh, transfer gas bonds. Yeah. So the nitrogen lone pair also negative. I think you have to think about maybe it is not a coordinating bond. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe some kind of a interaction, but uh, I'm not very sure it is a covalent bond or coordinating bond. But anyway, um, so I think you have to continue your work to get uh, more. of the method, yeah? Okay. Okay, any more questions? Okay, in the absence of any more questions, shall we thank her in usual manner? Okay, see, so we have come to the third presentation. This is on the identifying the removal efficiencies of arsenic-3 in wastewater by functionalized uh, nanocellulose. Uh, the authors are W. M. R. P. L. Vijayasuriya, S. A. Seni Radna, and N. B. Jai Radna. And this work will be presented by uh, W. M. R. P. L. Vijayasuriya. Good evening all, uh, I'm Layangika Vijayasuriya from Radrajat University of Sri Lanka presenting my abstract on identifying the removal efficiencies of arsenic-3 plus from wastewater by functionalized nanocellulose. First of all, I hope you all have seen this plant. This is Panica maximum or guinea grass which is known as an invasive plant in Sri Lanka. It acts as a superior competitor for resources, increasing the cost of land management and reducing the uh, land value. However, have you ever thought that this would be a good source of cellulose? Yes, of course. It's a good source of cellulose and the remaining black liquor after cellulose extraction become a good source of lignin. So, in shortly, the plant matter can be used to extract cellulose and when it comes to cellulose, it has a number of applications. However, when it comes to nanocellulose, it has tremendous amounts of applications due to its superior chemical and physical properties. S some of them are listed here as water filtration and environmental remediation, paper and packaging industry, biomedical and pharmacy, biosensing and catalyst. Among them, we were interested in water filtration and environmental remediation and there are research work that have been carried out on uh, heavy metal ion capturing by nanocellulose. And among these heavy metals, we were uh, interested in arsenic because arsenic is considered as a toxic metalloid 
and the inorganic arsenic exists as arsine, elemental arsenic, arsenite and arsenate. Among them, the trivalent ion is more toxic because it can kill at the sulfhydride groups of bioenzymes and proteins. Therefore, it shows acute and chronic toxicity symptoms. So this is the structure of cellulose, which is an environmentally friendly biocompatible material. And when it comes to nanocellulose, in contrast, there is a reduction of size. The diameter is falls between uh, less than 100 nanometers, but it can be several micrometers in length. Actually, it's a transparent material and uh, it has a reactive surface due to hydroxyl groups that provide different means of surface modifications. Normally, the acid hydrolysis is the common procedure that we use to produce nanocellulose, which is a top-down approach. So it breaks the beta-1,4 glycosidic bonds in cellulose and uh, the it's performed in the presence of a mineral acid. So what happens in here is the low density amorphous regions are susceptible to hydrolytic attack. Therefore, they, uh, the, the amorphous regions break apart, releasing the cell, uh, individual cellular crystals. And uh, this is the acid hydrolysis mechanism where the breakage of beta-1,4 glycosidic linkages take place. And uh, when we consider in the nanocellulose, the the uh, resultant of a functional group to the produced nanocellulose depends on the mineral acid that we are going to use. For an example, sulfuric acid results, sulfonated nanocellulose, and the phosphorylated nanocellulose are resulted from phosphoric acid. However, the hydrochloric acid does not produce any uh, functional group, but the sanitation procedure that can be carried out on hydrochloric acid can produce nanocellulose sanitates. And these three are the three species of nanocellulose, functionless nanocellulose that we use to study the absor uh, absorption or the removal behavior of the arsenic 3 plus by nanocellulose. Then coming to objectives, the objective of our research work are extraction of cellulose from panicum maximum and producing nanocellulose with sulfuric acid, phosphoric acid and hydrochloric acid and the sanitation of non-functionalized nanocellulose with carbon disulfide and sodium hydroxide and identifying the arsenic free plus removal efficiencies of functionalized nanocellulose and determination of the arsenic three plus concentrations in the media by UV visible spectroscope assisted method. Then we come to the procedure of cellulose extraction. So the blended and dried leaves of Panica Maximum were treated with 6% sodium hydroxide at 80 degrees of Celsius under three hour mechanical stirring and it was kept overnight. On the following day, the liquid portion was decanted and repeated the alkaline treatment. Then the residue fibers were filtered and washed with distilled water until the filtrate get neutral, then the bleaching treatment was carried out twice and the, the, fil the resultant cellulose fibers were again filtered and washed with distilled water and the resultant fibers were air dried. Then from that uh, pro produced or uh, extracted cellulose, the one gram work combined with 50% sulfuric acid and uh, stirred for 120 minutes at 60 degrees of Celsius and to quench the reaction called distilled water was added. After centrifugation, the separated supernatant and the residue was sonicated at room temperature and stored at low temperature. And then we come to the uh, acid hydrolysis of phosphoric acid. Again extracted one gram of uh, cellulose was soaked in distilled water and cooled for 15 minutes in an ice bath. Then 85% phosphoric acid was added. Then it was stirred and uh, again to quench the reaction called distilled water uh, added uh, ice bath was used and uh, after centrifugation the separated supernatant and residue was sonicated at room temperature and stored at low temperature. Then uh, the acid hydrolysis with hydrochloric acid, again the extracted one gram of cellulose was combined with uh, 6 MHCl and stirred for 120 minutes at 60 degrees of Celsius and to quench the reaction, again called distilled water was added. After centrifugation, the separated supernatant and the residue was sonicated at room temperature and stored at low temperature. As I mentioned earlier, the hydrochloric acid produced non-functionless nanocellulose, so to functionalize it, uh, 
the sanitation of nanocellulose was carried out with uh, one gram of nanocellulose suspension uh, combined with 4M sodium hydroxide and after three hours stirring at room temperature, carbon disulfide was added. Again, after three hours stirring, it was kept overnight. And this is the color change that's occurred after adding carbon disulfide. And uh, then you come to the arsenic 3 plus adsorption and detection procedure. In here, the, the arsenic 3 plus containing solution was allowed to get filtered through this functionalized nanocellulose fabricated filter paper. And from the filtrate, 3 milliliter was taken out and combined with uh, potassium iodate and sulfuric acid. After gentle shake, uh, EDTA was added. Again, after gentle shake, heptane was added as the organic layer. And again, after gentle shake, a color was developed on the organic layer. And the intensity of this color was measured by UV visible spectroscope assisted method. In this image, the image A shows the arsenic 3 plus solution which was, uh, which was not filtered and B represents the uh, arsenic 3 plus solution which was filtered through a normal filter paper and C represents the arsenic 3 plus solution which was filtered through sanitated nanocellulose fabricated filter paper. Accordingly, D represents the uh, filtrate of sulfonated nanocellulose fabricated filter paper and E represents the filtrate of phosphorylated nanocellulose fabricated filter paper. And then we come to the results and discussion. According to this graph, we can uh, clearly see that the functionalized nanocellulose shows high removal efficiency. Therefore, sanitated, sulfonated, and phosphorylated nanocellulose were used for further studies. Uh, coming to the summary of arsenic 3 plus removal, uh, in these three graphs, we can clearly see that the uh, sulfonated nanocellulose has shows the highest average percent, uh, percentage removal in uh, 200, 150 and 100 ppm solutions. So uh, then we check the reuse of membranes. Uh, however, the sulfonated nanocellulose fabricated filter paper was uh, tend to tear apart after its first use. Uh, interestingly, the sulfonate, uh, sorry, the phosphorylated and sanitated nanocellulose fabricated filter paper can still show high removal efficiencies over reuse. After performance study, then we studied about the thermal stability. In this image, we can see that the uh, sulfonated nanocellulose uh, has completely converted into char and phosphorylated nanocellulose fabricated filter paper were halfway converted into char and sanitated nanocellulose fabricated filter paper can still withstand the temperature of 80 degrees. And uh, then we checked the particle size were analyzed using dynamic light scattering technique. In here, the functionalized nanocellulose, uh, like a phosphorylated and sulfonated nanocellulose, shows low average particle sizes than non-functionalized nanocellulose. And uh, coming to the conclusion and future work, the invasive plant, Panicum maxima, can be used to, can be converted into a productive induce. The functionalized nanocellulose can be used to absorb, absorb arsenic 3 plus from wastewater in concentrations like 200 and 200 ppm solutions. And the concept can be further developed by uh, determining the arsenic 3 plus concentration uh, with the use of atomic absorption spectroscopy and the, the functionalized nanocellulose can be packed into a column and allow the arsenic 3 plus containing solution to get filtered through it for more higher removal efficiencies. And uh, with that, uh, this is these are my uh, references. And I would like to acknowledge my supervisor, Dr. Nalin Jaratna and Dr. Sujitra Seniviratna and uh, Professor Ranjit Tejri Singh and Professor Ajit Siherat from Faculty of Applied Sciences, Rajarat University of Sri Lanka, and uh, Faculty of Technology from Rajarat University of Sri Lanka for their assistance with analysis. And with that, this is the end of my presentation, and thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions? Yeah, thank you for presenting so ni nice study. And uh, uh, I have a curious about can you use the same type of technique to uh, remove some other uh, heavy metals like chromium or something like that? Yes, sir. Uh, 
Yes, uh, I, uh, I haven't done it, but I hope so because there are some research articles that said separately taken by the phosphoric, uh, uh, phosphoric compound and sulfonated compound can capture those ions. So I hope that this can uh, uh, work well also. Uh, but I haven't done it yet. So. Okay, yeah, it's better to check. Yeah. Yes, sir. So this is uh, uh, absorbed by ionosate. Uh, sir, for in the case of sanitation, I guess it's uh, because of chelation, uh, but in other cases, I hope like ad adsorption. Yes, uh, we, we, we take the sulfonated uh, first slide, or first or second slide. There. Yes. Yeah, because of sulfonated. sulfonated group. How how do you be sure that they are? Singly sulfonated. Sorry, sir? Singly sulfonated. Only the one oxygen, yes. OH1, is sulfonated. Yes, sir. Are you sure that it is uh, singly sulfonated? Because there are so many OH groups. Yes, sir. I hope, theoretically, I hope that would do because of the steric hindrance of other hydroxyl ions. I think it's depend on how much of sulfuric acid you use. Ah, I bet. So you better do the variation of the sulfuric acid concentration oh. and see whether there is an increase in efficiency or not. Okay, sir. Uh, that would help that uh, how many sulfonations are there. Okay, sir. And also we are not very sure about the structure. Okay, sir. I think you are continuing your Yes, sir, this is my undergraduate studies. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah, just a small one. Why did you check the thermal stability? Sorry, sir. Madam? Why did you check the thermal stability at the end? Uh, this uh, came with an ob observation, like uh, when we I tried to dry these filter papers very quite Quickly, I uh, dried it with oven and at 80 degrees of Celsius, I got this observation. So, uh, I hope that it will help in uh, if you use this kind of um, filter papers in commercial grade. That's depend, uh, that's came out from my observation. I did not do it in purposely at uh, see whether we at which concentration, at which temperature that it dries up. absence of any more questions shall we wind up this uh, presentation and thank the presenter in the usual manner <laughs> so we reached to the fourth presentation um, on graphene derivatives for supercapacitors applications uh, the authors are all in uh, Malawarachi D.P. Gizanayaka and N.P.W. Ratu, Ratuwadi. The presenter is Owen uh, Malawiyara. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ovini Malawalarachi. So today my presentation title is Graphene Derivatives for Supercapacitor Application. So as you all know, the deteriorating economic situation in Sri Lanka has led to the severe impact on the energy crisis. So basically this was due to the usage of traditional energy sources like coal, oil, and natural gases. Therefore, the development and utilization of eco-friendly, reliable, high-performance high uh, energy storage devices coming into the picture. So basically electrochemical supercapacitors, uh, it gained the more attraction due to its more advantageous behavior. So this is the outline of this presentation, and I will go through each section. So graphite, it is a mineral which is naturally abundant in Sri Lanka. 
So basically, natural graphite, it can be further subcategorized into three principal types. So this is basically depend on their purity, uh, vein graphite or the lamp graphite and flake graphite and amorphous graphite. Among that, vein graphite, it contains the highest purity and basically it is uh, very useful for energy related applications. So graphite is converted into graphene as a value addition and also this enhances the monetary value and the properties of graphite. So graphene contains superior properties and some of them are listed here. So graphene has become the highly promising material for energy related applications, specifically for lithium ion batteries, super caps and solar cells. So graphene can be synthesized from graphite through various physical and chemical approaches. Some of them are listed here like mechanical exfoliation, Hammer's method, modified Hammer's method and electrochemical exfoliation. So most of these are too sophisticated, expensive and it requires expertise knowledge and time consuming. But the electrochemical exfoliation, it gains more attention due to its simplicity, cost effectiveness, time efficiency and green approach. The major limitation of the synthesized graphene is its tendency to restacking of graphene layers. So basically this is due to their Van der Waal interactions. So uh, the research question that arises in this study is how to develop an easy cost effective and greener electrochemical method to overcome the limitations associated with existing methods will also hinder the heavy re-aggregation to improve the electrochemical performance of the material. So the approach that I used to access the research question is uh, synthesizing graphene derivatives. So uh, it is done through the modification of morphology of graphene via flow production. So this study is basically focused on the synthesis of porous graphene. So uh, porous graphene, that is one of the most important graphene derivative. So a novel one step one photoelectrochemical approach utilized to synthesize graphene and porous graphene and we manipulate the composition of the electrolyte solution. So the novelty of this study is utilizing one step one pot electrochemical exfoliation with favorable additives to synthesize porous graphene and the significance is an easy cost effective time efficient greener approach which is easily scalable for the synthesis of porous graphene for energy related applications. So the overall objective of this study is to develop a novel one step one pot electrochemical approach to synthesize porous graphene. Once after achieving the overall objective, eventually we was able to achieve the other two objectives as well. And to achieve the overall objective, uh, we use some specific objectives as well, like synthesizing material structural characterization and the electrochemical characterization. So this is the experimental overview, material synthesis, structural characterization, uh, using SCM, XRD and FGIR electrode preparation and electrochemical characterization. So I will elaborate these terms in next few slides. So material synthesis. So uh, in this study, basically we are synthesized graphene and porous graphene. So for that we use one step, one pot electrochemical exfoliation approach. And the setup that we used is two electrode electrolytic cell. Graphite rod was used as the anode and the stainless steel electrode was used as the cathode. And we applied a, bio, a constant potential across the two electrodes. So in graphene synthesis, uh, the additives are ammonium sulfate and sulfuric. In porous graphene synthesis, the additives are phytic acid and ammonium sulfate. Once after synthesizing each material, we subjected it to structural and electrochemical characterization. So this is the X-ray diffraction patterns of the graphite, graphene and porous graphene. So all these diffraction peaks are in accordance with the International Center for Diffraction Data. So as you can see here, graphite, it has an intense sharp peak around 26.5 degrees. So this confirm the high degree of crystallinity of graphite. And when you come to graphene, you can see an extensive peak broadening there. So this confirmed the formation of monolayer graphene rather than the formation of graphene oxide. And also you can see all these peaks are located in nearly equal value. 
That means this confirmed the formation of graphene and porous graphene synthesis during the synthesis. So these are the scanning electron microscopic images of graphite and porous graphene with varying magnification. So graphite, it has a thin plate-like shape and for porous graphene, you can see there are some pores in the graphene sheet. So this is the uh, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopic data we obtained for graphite and porous graphene. And the peaks are automatically identified by the software. So again, it confirmed the formation of porous graphene. So um, once after doing the material characterization, now I'm moving on to the electrochemical characterization. So for that, to test the electrochemical performance, we have to uh, we evaluate it using a three electrode setup. In this setup, silver silver chloride electrode used as the reference electrode, and platinum electrode used as the counter electrode, and we are using four working electrodes here. The working electrode is prepared by, uh, uh, prepared on the fluorine doped tin oxide electrode, and we coated the electrode slurry using the Dr. Blading approach. And the composition of the electrode slurry is active material, conductive additive, and the binder. So we use four different active materials, graphene, porous graphene, graphite, and activated charcoal. So graphite is the raw material for graphene and porous graphene. And activated charcoal is the commercially available material for supercapacitor applications. So, uh, in cyclic voltammetry, the operating voltage and the capacitance of the material is evaluated. Uh, and in the GCD analysis, galvanostatic charge discharge analysis, we are applying a constant current and we observe uh, the potential uh, cyclic behavior of the material throughout the operating voltage. And in EIS, uh, we perturb our material with a sinusoidal potential with a small amplitude and we observe the output signal. Basically, it gives three plots, Nyquist, body modulus, and body phase plots. This is used to get the qualitative inside of the process. So these are the cyclic voltagrams I obtained for, uh, for the activated charcoal, graphite, graphene, and porous graphene, and we did this for three different scan rates, but the 100 millivolt data was avoided due to their more noisy behavior. And from the overlay of CV curve, we can get an idea about the high specific capacitance nature of the porous graphene compared to the other material. So as you can see here, for each and every material, the high specific capacitance observed at the lowest scan rate and porous graphene has the highest specific capacitance for each and every scan rate. So this data confirm the highest specific capacitance value of the graphene and porous graphene. Uh, so this is the GCD curves uh, obtained for the for different materials. And here you can see the overlay of GCD curves. Uh, nearly these curves are in triangular shape. This exhibits the ideal capacitive behavior, um, but graphene is an exception there. So from that, we can uh, extract the potential drop and the charge discharge time data. So from this data, we can conclude porous graphene have a lower resistance compared to activated charcoal, but in graphite and graphene, uh, there is a slight deviation for, therefore we need an optimization for that. And in charge discharge time ratio, the all values are nearly equal to one. Uh, this is the overlay of Nyquist plot. Basically, this contains three regions, high frequency region, mid frequency region, and the low frequency region. In high frequency region, you can see a semicircle with equal dimension. That means a process common to each and every material occur. That can be the charge transfer process. And in mid frequency region, you can see a uh, semicircle, but its dimension when it comes from activated charcoal to porous graphene, it get reduces. So basically this can be due to the reduced resistance and ion diffusion. In low frequency region, you can see a uh, straight line for graphene and porous graphene. So this can 
This is due to the capacitive behavior. So again, the body plots are also reconfirm these processes. And for get a more quantitative idea, we are we drew equivalent circuits for each material, and you can see in uh, the first thing uh, that is the solution resistance. I mean, in each circuit, and the second uh, process is the charge transfer, and the third uh, second proce uh, process is the uh, capacitive behavior, and these are confirmed by the values obtained for these constant phase element, and again, this data shows the uh, reduced resistance and improved capacitance behavior. So these are the conclusions of this study. So basically porous graphene has the highest capacitive behavior in supercapacitor application. And also EIS data shows the reduced resistance, increased capacitance, and improved diffusion for graphene and porous graphene compared to activated charcoal and graphite. And the electrochemical exfoliation is an easy, greener, and scalable approach to synthesize graphene. So these are the references that I followed during the study. Uh, so I would like to acknowledge my supervisors, Dr. Nadisha P. W. Rathuadu and Professor Damika Disanayaka for their NMS support, and all the laboratory staff members and my colleagues. So thank you so much all for hearing my presentation. Uh, any questions? <coughs> yeah. Very nice presentation. Have you ever thought of uh, measuring the surface area of these uh, porous graphenes? Yes, sir. Can we use, uh, in when preparing the electrode, I coated it into one into one square centimeter area. No, no, no. I, I mean the surface area of the porous graphene samples. Because the surface area is a quantity that ha you have to measure because it, it, it always goes with the uh, capacitance. You have the higher surface area, the capacitance should be high, right? Yeah, I'm saying. So, have you measured the, I, I mean the bed surface area or something like that? BET surface surface areas. Sorry, sir? BET, Brenner, no, Emmett Teller surface areas? No, sir. No? We okay. didn't do that characterization. Okay, okay, okay. Just curious. Thank you. Can you pl please go to that uh, cyclic voltammetry slide? Sure. Where you had a comparison with uh, all the four samples. Uh, before that, maybe, I think. All four in the slide. Before that, maybe before previous slide. Ah, yeah, that one. So what's this noise in B? Why you have this drastic noise in there? Yeah, madam, uh, that was due to the binder. So basically, uh, we use CM carboxymethyl cellulose as the binder. So that might be the most. Uh, that might not be the most appropriate bi binder for that compound. Uh, due to that COVID situation in Sri Lanka, uh, we are lack of the chemical, we are in a chemical shortage. That's why we use uh, CMC as the binder. How many cycles did you run this one? Just one cycle. I mean, in the cyclic world, I mean, how many times did you try this one? Sorry, madam, I didn't get you. Uh, it's okay. Just uh, I'm asking the last one, the equivalent circuits also you got from the software, right? Not something, the equivalent circuits that you got later on. I it directly I drew it from, from the, the software or you did it? Drew it from the software. Directly got from the software. Okay, thank you. Absence of further questions, shall we thank the speaker uh, in short manner?
fifth presentation uh, that is on selection of uh, RNA ap aptamers to distinguish the V600E uh, mutation status of BRAF protein, uh, a potential of Sirico approach. Uh, the authors are M. B. Vijayasuriya, A. M. S. Vatnaika, W. S. S. Vijayasundara, and S. P. Cholabunia, presented by M. B. Vijayasuriya. Chairperson, panel of judges, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to all of you. I'm Nauda Vijay Surya from the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology of Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. My presentation is titled Selection of RNA Aptamers to Distinguish the V600E Mutation Status of the BRAF Protein, a Potential in Silico Approach. First, let's see what are aptamers. Aptamers are short, single-stranded, artificial nucleic acid or peptide sequences which can bind to their specific targets due to their particular three-dimensional structure. Therefore, these are considered analogous to antibodies uh, and can, uh, and can uh, utilized as uh, alternatives for antibodies in a variety of biomedical applications. And they are also considered advantages of antibodies when they are used in uh, some bio biomedical applications. They can be used as uh, potential biosensing probes, diagnostic and therapeutic agents for drug discovery, and as targeting molecules in drug delivery systems. The BRAF V600E mutation results in a valine to glutamate substitution at the activation loop of the BRAF protein. The BRAF protein is an important protein which participates in the MAP kinase signal transduction pathway, which is an important uh, pathway for normal cell division or proliferation, growth, and differentiation. However, the mutant BRAF protein resulted, by, uh, resulted is hyperactive and leads to constitutive activation of this pathway. Hence, this is hyperactive and leads to uncontrolled cell division and ultimately can cause cancer. The BRAF v 6 e mutation is recognized as a most common mutation in the BRAF gene with a high prevalence in cancers such as metastatic melanoma, papillary thyroid carcinoma, and colorectal cancer. Development of efficient diagnostic and prognostic assays, imaging technologies, and therapeutics is of immense importance for the precise management of uh, these malignancies, where aptimers, which can specifically detect and distinguish the wild type and the V600E mutant BRAF proteins, will be highly applied. However, no aptimers have been designed as recognition elements for the wild type and V600E mutant BRAF proteins. Hereafter, the V600E mutant BRAF will be referred as a mutant BRAF protein. Therefore, the, in the current study, an approach was made to design aptamers which can distinguish the wild type and the mutant BRAF proteins using computational methods. The in silico modeling protocol uh, to determine aptamers which are highly specific and which can bind to, the, bind to a particular protein with high affinity requires previously determined aptamers using in vitro methods. However, when searched in the aptogen aptamer database, which is the only currently available aptamer database, there were no aptamers available for BRAF. Therefore, uh, this database was searched for aptamers which targeted uh, to protein kinases other than BRAF. This was based on the fact that uh, the protein kinase domain shown in the picture has an essentially similar three-dimensional structure which is conserved among all protein kinases. It has conserved subdomains or a conserved fold. Aptamers for ERK1 and 2, which are serine threonine kinases, like BRAF, were available in the aptogen aptamer database. 
these aptamers were targeting the activation loop in the uh, protein kinase domain of VRK1 and 2. Uh, since the pro, uh, structures of the protein kinase domain, uh, domains of the two proteins are conserved, and because the BRAF B6 RNA mutation is present at the activation loop, uh, we were interested in finding out whether these aptamers designed for ARK1 and 2 can also target the activation loop of the wild type and mutant BRAF proteins. For this research, the following methods were carried out. First, X-ray crystallography structures of the wild type and V6 RNA mutant BRAF proteins were retrieved from the RCSB protein data bank and the X-ray crystallography structures which best satisfied the selection criteria were used for the docking. Next, these protein structures were prepared for docking by the removal of undesired chains and ligands using UCSF chimera. And next, the missing segments of the protein structures were modeled using modeler uh, in the UCSF chimera interface. Next, these models were further refined using ISOLD in the UCSF Chimera X interface. Next, these modeled and refined structures were directed to external validation using Project ERAT and Verified 3D. Regarding the retrieval of aptama sequences, the APTA index database by Aptagen was manually searched for aptamas which were targeting uh, uh, protein kinases. Then sequences of five RNA aptamas which target the activation loop of ERK1 and 2, the sequences were retrieved. Next, the two-dimensional and three-dimensional structures of these aptamas sequences were predicted and optimized using RNA fold and 3D RNA web servers respectively. Then these aptama models were docked with the wild type and mutant BRAF proteins using the Haddock easy interface of the Haddock 2.4 web server. Altogether, there were 10 combinations of aptama and protein complexes. Here, uh, the default parameters of the easy interface of the Haddock 2.4 web server was used because this is an elementary experiment. After the docking, the best class cluster identified by Haddock was used for further analysis. Uh, then the Haddock score of the dock complexes were evaluated and complexes which obtained negative Haddock scores when docked with both proteins were used for further analysis of intermolecular hydrogen bonds and salt bridges, which are considered as a strong, strongest intermolecular interactions uh, between aptamers and proteins using the default parameters in the h bonds tool of Chimera X interface. Moving on to the results and discussion, it was found that aptamers 1, 2, and 3 could obtain negative Haddock scores when docked with both wild type and mutant BRAF proteins. This finding suggested that these aptamers can presumably target the activation loop of the wild type and mutant BRAF proteins. Further, uh, when the pores of the dog complex was, complexes were displayed, it revealed that uh, these aptamers can target at the interface of the activation loop of both wild type and mutant BRAF proteins. Uh, it should be noted that the do these docking results by Haddock can be, uh, um, are very accurate, can be gar guaranteed very accurate because all the protein structures of the modeling met with all the external validation quality criteria. Since the Haddock score only cannot be used to compare the binding affinity of a particular aptama to a protein or to compare between complexes, uh, the intermolecular interactions of the uh, dock complexes, particularly the hydrogen bonds and the salt bridges were analyzed. Um, and it was found that aptamas one and aptama three, as shown in these graphs, uh, 
show preferable binding with the BRAF wild type and BRAF mutant proteins respectively when the total number of hydrogen bonds and salt bridges and the perceived higher bonding energy of a salt bridge to hydrogen bond are considered. Therefore, with the results of this uh, docking done by Haddock 2.4 web server and the intermolecular interaction analysis, it can be concluded that uh, aptima 1 and aptima 3 can be considered as potential starting structures for the in silico modeling uh, workflow for aptimus for wild type and mutant BRAF proteins respectively. It should be noted that this is an ongoing study and as future aspects, docking should be extended by using other docking software such as Autodock Wiener and Smina. Uh, and also other docking softwares uh, which uses uh, different scoring parameters that is for uh, to reconfirm the docking and to validate the docking process done by Haddock. Uh, next, it is recommended to perform molecular dynamic simulations uh, for more accurate determination of the binding energy and stability of the dock complexes. Next, it is important to uh, analyze the dock complexes after molecular dynamic simulations to find out what are the important structural features of the aptimus responsible for the binding. Then accordingly, uh, aptima mutations, alterations and chemical modifications can be done uh, which, are, uh, which are important for stronger binding between the aptima and the protein. Then the whole cycle should be repeated until aptimus which are highly specific and with high affinity for the particular protein here, the wild type and the BRAF V600 and E mutant protein are obtained. Next, it is very important to keep in mind that all these aptima structures uh, modeled using in, silico, uh, using in silico approaches should be tested at in vitro settings in uh, real experimental settings. And such aptimas developed for which can distinguish the wild type and the V600 and E mutant BRAF proteins can be applied as recognition elements uh, to be used in different uh, diagnostic and prognostic assays to detect different cancers. Uh, this marks the end of my presentation. Here are some of my references. And I wish to acknowledge my supervisors for their valuable advices and guidance given throughout this study, and also the conference com committee for accepting my paper and giving me a chance to present it at this conference. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Actually, this is not a question. Uh, this is a kind of a comment that uh, we have to be aware of. Even antibodies cross-react. Cross-reaction means they bind non-target uh, uh, proteins. So s similar thing could happen with regard to your aptimus uh, at a greater level because the, their binding specificity is not that uh, 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 their binding is not that specific when it comes to aptima and uh, a target protein and they don't have uh, receptor ligand like interactions they, they just go there if they can even physically attach they attach once something is attached to a protein and uh, their 3d structure is affected the protein is not going to do anything so it's a kind of a shotgun. <laughs> you fire it, uh, you, you open fire. So this is a highly dangerous technology. Keep that in mind when you work in this area. Unless you find absolutely reliable specificity between aptima and your target protein, you should not employ it. Yes, sir. I'm now uh, working on uh, using other docking algorithms, Autodock Vina. Yes, so uh, you are still not uh, started any 
Yeah, yeah, I'm not still not started. Yeah, yeah, applications. So when you are doing the real applications, you have to be very sure about the specificity of. I think this cycle has to be done repeatedly yeah. many, many times uh, before yes, you go to the real sample. Yeah. So there, there's a l uh, huge amount of work to be done to come to that actual yes. final outcome, yeah, but final. the in silico uh, uh, approaches can be d uh, done to like lead those uh, in vitro processes, uh, and it is uh, it can like uh, we can save so much of time, and this is a very uh, recent er a very new area of study. Okay, any further questions? Uh, uh, so we'll wind up the presentation and uh, thank you very much. For <laughs> so the, the we reached to the last presentation and this will be on uh, comparison of classical time series model and machine learning uh, LSTM model to forecast paddy production in Sri Lanka. The authors are IBI Sandarwani and R.A.B. Kunawadana, uh, presented by I.E.I. Sandarwani. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I am Imesha Sandurwani, uh, Department of Statistics, Faculty of Science, University of Colombo. Uh, my research topic was a comparison of classical time series models and machine learning LSTM model to forecast paddy production in Sri Lanka. As we all know, rice is the dietary staple and the major domestic crop cultivated in Sri Lanka. And paddy production is the livelihood of more than 1.8 million Sri Lankan farmers. Uh, specifically with the current economic crisis in Sri Lanka, prices of basic food products at high levels and the expenditure on rice sector has increased continuously, mainly due to the uh, fertilizer issue and fuel shortage happened during last few years. Therefore, uh, I thought having a very accurate forecast on the paddy production uh, of Sri Lanka, that is the main food product of Sri Lanka, is important for importing requirements and it's much significant at this time to ensure the food security of the country. Uh, in there, forecasting by machine learning models attracted uh, much attention recent times compared to traditional statistical modeling. So in this study, uh, a comparison of forecasting accuracy between classical uh, autoregressive in, uh, integrated moving average model and double exponential smoothing model with long short term memory modeling approach was done. Uh, the, the basic motivate of this study was to uh, identify the best, uh, uh, best time series forecasting model to forecast annual paddy production of Sri Lanka. Uh, and I hope this will be a material for future researchers as well. Uh, it will be at knowledge on time series forecasting as well. Uh, now let's move on to the methodology. Uh, the annual paddy production data of Sri Lanka from 1952 to 2021 was used uh, for this study from Department of Census and Statistics, Sri Lanka. The forecasting performance of classical time series, that is ARIMA and double exponential smoothing models are compared with LSTM uh, model, uh, forecasting model. 
In here, the Arriva modeling approach, Box Jenkins methodology was used. Uh, in double exponential smoothing modeling approach, uh, here I use the double exponential smoothing modeling approach because I saw that the, the Sri Lankan paddy production data has only a trend component but don't have a seasonal component when we, see, when we take the data, yearly data. And uh, I wanted to uh, uh, make, uh, deliver the short term forecast, that's why I use the double exponential smoothing model here. Uh, in double exponential smoothing modeling, specified weight initialization method was used to determine the smooth values of the model. Uh, when consider the machine learning models, uh, LSTM model was selected and LSTM is a special kind of recurrent neural network. Uh, it is capable of learning long term uh, dependencies by having memory cells and gates that control the information flow of the, uh, through the memory cells. In LSTM modeling approach, uh, mean squared error was used as the loss function and Adam optimization algorithm was used as the optimization algorithm. To calculate the weight of the network, the gradient descent method was utilized and uh, adjust the weight of the interconnection to minimize the sum of squared of error of the model. Uh, now let's see the data analysis and results part. In ARIMA model selection approach, with the help of ACF and PSVF plots, ARIMA 211 has been selected as the best model, best ARIMA family model to forecast paddy production of Sri Lanka, which has the lowest AIC and BIC values. In double exponential smoothing modeling approach, the optimal values of level and trend parameter were selected as 0.1 and 0.4, uh, which has the minimum absolute deviation value and mi minimum uh, absolute mean squared uh, deviation values. In LSTM modeling approach, uh, the LSTM model with five important uh, five input component. That means last uh, uh, when taking last five years data with three nodes, 61 batch size, and two epochs has the uh, has found as which has the lowest mean squared error value. So it was selected as the best LSTM model to forecast paddy production of Sri Lanka. Uh, after selecting uh, uh, the best model from each three approaches. Uh, the forecasting performance of these three type of models, that is ARIMA, double exponential smoothing and LSTM are compared with their forecasting behavior. Uh, using the uh, forecasting accuracy measures, root mean squared error, mean absolute error and mean absolute percentage error. In there, uh, uh, which has the, uh, the LSTM model has lowest these uh, statistics values, so it was uh, it has the uh, very accurate uh, forecasting values compared to other two type of models. Hence, LSTM model was selected as the best model to forecast annual paddy production of Sri Lanka uh, compared to other two models. Uh, according to LSTM model uh, forecast, in year 2022, Sri Lanka is expected to have 4,919 metric tons of paddy production. In year 2023, it is expected to have 4,886 uh, metric tons of paddy production and in year 2024, it is expected to have 5,341 metric tons of paddy production in Sri Lanka. In conclusion, uh, it can be said that LSTM model is better than uh, the ARIMA modeling approach and double exponential smoothing modeling approach to forecast paddy production of Sri Lanka. Uh, and other finding is that uh, Sri Lanka is expected to have uh, a lower paddy production in year 2022 and 2023, uh, but in 2024 it will be uh, increased. In uh, it will be increased. Uh, uh, with these forecasting values, uh, the policymakers can uh, can make plan to make decisions on rice imports and. Uh, uh, to encourage the paddy farmers on higher production to make country self-sufficient. As well, I hope this will bring awareness of paddy production, indirectly the rice production towards positive side. And also LSTM model can be recommended as uh, a best model to uh, best model to make short-term uh, short forecast compared to uh, other uh, classical time series models. So these are the references I have used in this study. And I would like to give my sincere gratitude to uh, Dr. R.A.B. Abe Guravardhana, who is the head of Department of Statistics, Faculty of Science, University of uh, Colombo, for guiding me in this uh, study. And thank you very much. Okay.
Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions? Okay, thank you, but uh, it was difficult for me to grab the parts of your presentation because there was no figures there. So from the numbers, I was thinking, so what are the negative factors you included in this uh, process? This is a forecasting, right? Yes. So considering the factors, negative factors, what are the negative factors you incorporated for the future in this study uh, forecasting? Uh, I mean, did you include any such, so with this forecasting, uh, all the, tr uh, like, what are the shortcomings that we can have in here and so on? Uh, here I use time series modeling approach. Time series, in time series modeling approach, uh, we use past, past, uh, past data and make, uh, make uh, forecast on future. Here we do not consider about factors affecting for this. Uh, uh, but as a future research, I hope to uh, conduct, a, uh, I hope to extend this research on what are the factors affecting the production of Sri Lanka as well, paddy production of Sri Lanka as well. Data, data only, mm. not the factors. That may not be the best way of doing it, uh, but uh, yeah, the, the other factors also has to be. Yeah, the land area and things yeah. have drastically changed, and so. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, so looks like. Um, no more questions, and uh, we'll thank the speaker for their presentation. So, most of these uh, presentation we heard today are very interesting, and um, done by mostly by the undergraduates um, with the uh, help of the supervisors. And uh, they have done, most of them have done outstanding work and uh, I'm very happy to see that uh, their uh, skills and um, I congratulate all of them for their good work and um, hope that they will continue in their higher studies uh, in future. And I also want to thank that all the supervisors who has guide these students. And um, so that's the end of the today's session, session three, and we had a very successful uh, session. And finally, I would like to thank the KDU of uh, organizing this event. Thank you very much. <coughs>
We will now go for a short break and join the final technical session at 3 p.m. Thank you. We kindly invite you all for the tea break, which is arranged outside.